Hello and welcome. This is the extended content of part two of Spying on America by Foreign Made Drones. If you have not seen the first part, please go watch that as that was the introductory part and main questions. This video continues with more questions from the panel of the original six presenters and starts off right where the conversation left off in the first video, so please watch that one first before jumping into this one. We hope that you enjoy this extended content, and if you have any questions or comments, please post them into the comment section below, and of course, please like and subscribe to our channel. Next question. As this one is for you again, Harry Wingo, and Dr. Mum. As drones send their positional sensor data, aircraft health, and situation awareness data through networks and various visualization mobile apps, what suggestions do you have to stop bad actors from still spying with US only drone systems? Thank you, it's a great question. And I know Hans will have some more technical things and I look forward to hearing his comments. But for me up front, I would say, uh, again, just because it's made in the United States, that's not the only answer. I like the idea of zero trust. I'm not sure that's come, come up, you know, that, you know, trust but verify, but now we're moving into a model where it's well, never trust, <laughs> always verify. And so the question is, how do you get that type of approach, that type of culture, really, to move out? Even if these are uh, US-made drones, it's, it's complicated what that will mean. But I think the main thing is to make sure that we are approaching this with the seriousness of, say, uh, the electricity industry. Um, not to say that they haven't had things happen, but that type of culture is befitting for the critical infrastructure that these drones will become. And we're not talking, I mean, yes, people think of uh, hobby drones or taking pictures, but once you go into infrastructure use, uh, if you have a drone, for example, that could launch uh, towards the sound of gunfire, Chattanooga was asking for this authority, uh, and they are flying missions over people in urban environments, and perhaps maybe non-lethal technologies on board. You could tear gas somebody from a drone, that's serious. And even if it's a USA drone, again, you have to have that approach from you know, putting, baking security in from the beginning. You have to remember the human element on all of these things. And so the same way that you have uh, the seriousness of the ICS and SCADA professionals to look at operational technology, because that's the complexity of this, to really make sure that, uh, making sure the bad actors, the adversary, and there's a range. You've got the spectrum, uh, ne'er-do-wells who don't have the same resources, all the way up to nation state capabilities and that is absolutely what we've been talking about with regards to, to China, but we know who the others are. So I would say it's, it's to realize that there is no finish line. We have to at least get ourselves out of this whack-a-mole faulty foundation with Chinese drones. But once we get to what I would consider, uh, it, it's like, a, it's, it's, it's not the, the end all. Uh, it is kind of a golden doorway that we will go through, but we have to act like grown-ups on the other side of it. And this is hard work. We have to make sure that we continue to adhere to first principles, even with USA made drone, manufactured, sourced supply chain, you know, those types of amazing drones. Let's get them as soon as possible, but we have to follow the basics on security and risk management. Absolutely. So I would agree um, with what Harry was saying. US made drones is not going to be a panacea to fix everything. It will get us in, in a certain direction. But if we start to look at certain things like, you know, what devices are you using to control your drone with, right? So hobbyist drones can be controlled with everything from a cell phone to, uh, you know, iPads to whatever else. So, you know, are you controlling your drone with your iPhone? Interesting. Where do you think that information is going? Uh, so when we look at the security of whether it's, you know, an, uh, uh, you know, a drone that's made here in America, it's all the other devices that connect up to it. And where does that information end up going? <clears throat> and by the way, how do we actually determine that it was made in America? Um, it's amazing to see how many, um, I've looked up a lot of different companies um, because I like, I will flash these, uh, these systems to get all of that unnecessary uh, software off of there to stop it from phoning home, to stop doing all that. So I'll flash these systems in order to do that. But when you go in and you start to look at uh, applications that are, you know, simple uh, media applications or data applications uh, or visual applications, and you look at the, the company, oh, they have a Dallas, Texas address. They, they have a California address. And when you start actually looking to see who owns these people, 
what you find out is, is it's overseas entities that own these people. How many people have actually read through the data agreements, the hundreds and hundreds of pages of a data agreement for every single piece of software that you have? Nobody. And they know that. So they will put a line in there that says, yeah, we're foreign owned and yeah, our data is, is going to, to be mirrored by our foreign partner. And you're going to click yes. <laughs> it's just the way it goes. Uh, so I think that, you know, there's things like this that we can, we can start to look at, but then we also have to look at, uh, you know, how do we make sure, you know, even if it's a U.S. drone, how do we make sure that we don't do a simple, you know, drone strike type of a thing? Uh, drone strike software has been available since about 2013, 2014, and that allows one drone to take over another drone. So, you know, even if it's a U.S. drone, you know, can a U.S. drone be taken over by a DJI drone? Um, so we still have to put protocols in place. We still have to start to look at, you know, how do we secure these things down the line? What do we really want them to do? Uh, and, and how do we use them in society? The other challenge that we have, and Joel mentioned it, and so did Harry, is the training. Training aspect is uh, um, such an issue that people don't realize. They're not understanding the spectrum of issues that are out there for security and other things. But one of the things we're not looking at is the human factors. So, you know, we have, and this is something that I, I attempted to work uh, with some of the government on, I'm not sure that I was successful, um, is looking at the idea that if you have an EOD dog, if you have a, a bomb sniffing dog, you're going to send that dog for training specific. Then you're going to send its handler to training specific. Then you're going to have a UAV with that handler. Well, great. Do all three of these things trust each other? Do they understand what they're going to do? Do they understand how things fit together? They probably don't. And so when, when I need to be able to trust what that UAV is going to do, have I actually gone to UAV trust school? It doesn't exist. So when you start to look at, at being able to do, uh, you know, advanced virtual reality, when you start to be able to do something like this, this is like, you know, back in the old days, uh, um, you know, kids used to have to uh, walk around with a, a doll to simulate what happens if you have a child. Well, this is the same idea. Can you simulate actually having a drone or actually having uh, an autonomous system with you all the time? And how do you interact with it? And how do you trust it? And how does it trust what you're going to do? So there's a lot more uh, in there when we're looking at just, you know, U.S. made product or U.S. made drones we have to start to look at the entire spectrum of all of the different autonomous. Oh my gosh, Hans, I got to jump in. Uh, you, you guys know me. I have to get my constitution up, but here's my uh, French made drone. Now we've talked about a lot of issues here, but let's, let's remember what it takes to get human teams and culture and art. I hold the constitution up because what the founders intended is that as Americans, uh, as, as civilians, right? Our community to understand, I mean, second amendment, I believe in it. So as far as a drone goes, it can be used to harm or to protect. And the idea that, uh, you know, bits and bullets can hurt, but they can also defend. We have to have that culture where people realize this is serious. Uh, this is the same way that we should understand our phones more. Until we get to that point, until Americans realize this type of gear should be made here, but the same way that we don't go to I don't know, we don't buy AK-47s because they're cheaper or convenient and then change them to fit our own rounds. Hell, we make them ourselves. <laughs> and so the same way to have kids, you've got great programs like Gen Cyber, right? Gen Cyber, uh, look it up. That's one of those uh, amazing programs, free cyber camp for kids. Uh, you know, one of my daughters went through it. That sort of thing for IoT, like Dean Kamen and First Robotics, we have to start there but it also has to be something that every American doesn't just go, you know, we'll let somebody else go. And the culture of a leave the factory set password, that's why we're in so much trouble on IoT. So the hard work is to realize that yes, all of this is important, but it comes down uh, to human actors, but it also comes down to the network, the community of folks who are really thinking of the bigger risk. Uh, that's what it's gonna take, easier said than done we have to remember that that's also a very important part of this beyond the technology. So I think that, you know, it, when it comes to civilians being engaged, I think people need to be much more engaged. When you have uh, places like North Dakota who authorizes weapons, uh, non-lethal weapons on their drones for use um, and the community 
Do they even know that? Do they even understand that? Um, I'm going to say no, that they don't understand it. Because if I had a drone flying over me, and next thing I know, I'm getting, you know, tased or I've got pepper balls being sprayed at me. How do you, how do you even know that I'm the suspect that you're looking for? Why? Because I've got short hair. Right. No, it, it's it, people need to be much more involved in what's going on. And, and a big thought on that is because if we consider China uh, as a uh, peer competitor, nation state, they do not have to go through the civil liberties breaks and speed bumps that we do. They've got a Uyghur issue, for example, ethnic minority up in the northwest part of the country. It is all holds, no holds barred on what they can do with these cyber physical systems. You know, and we can't see it. For, not everybody sees what's going on with that. And so we have to understand, yes, we have to address the privacy, the other concerns. We have the Constitution to work through, but we can do it. But the values, uh, our Constitution is going to go into the drones that we have. But how, how are we going to do that with Chinese drones? As the foundation, we can't. We have to build these systems. But we also have to build a culture of safety and of responsibility uh, with this. And I, I think there are some, some things that are really interesting concerning, like if you look at uh, the power of uh, weapons and what guns have meant in American history, responsibility. And there's a lot of folks, and I, I know drones may not seem that way, but you never know where technology is gonna go. And we have to get at the source of it and really infuse every American with uh, a knowledge and an understanding of how uh, this is gonna shape so many things in the West. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you all are answering this. Uh, I mean, it's amazing. Uh, the background that you all have and what you're able to share with everybody watching this. Well, let me ask you a question. Uh, this is for uh, this is for Harry and for uh, Chris. What can the USA Drone Port uh, do to help uh, advance the trusted uh, workforce uh, and help with the trusted marketplace? Is there anything organizations like this can do? Uh, thanks. You're already doing it. God bless you. <laughs> I love it. But then I think the things that just keep doing more of what you're doing. And I think the most important things to call out on this for the workforce is continue to communicate, uh, continue to reach the members of Congress, uh, the champions on Capitol Hill that you have, uh, the champions, champions that you have in state and in region and also beyond. Uh, the National Governors Association, making sure that they have what they need to know what you're doing and then be able to duplicate those efforts uh, in other places. Uh, I would say on the workforce side, uh, that takes reaching out to the companies, uh, getting folks who may not have considered what drones could do uh, to have them understand that not only can you give them information, but they can come and try things out, concepts with Drone Port USA. And yes, the support, uh, the, the interaction between uh, the, those companies and also the academic environment, the great institutions of higher learning uh, that you have uh, in state are, are, are really important. And again, you, you are. Uh, serving as uh, a best practices, uh, you know, model to hold up. So I think to keep doing more of that. And as far as a trusted marketplace, for example, uh, Ellen Lord uh, with the Pentagon and for acquisition to understand that drones is one of the flagship issues after the president last June, President Trump said that it's a matter of national security to have a drone industrial base. And so in addition, you know, to the research, but to actually really show this is where we can start doing the manufacturing, uh, how it will fit into the ecosystem that we have or that other states have, and to really start working to identify, and here's one last thing, I'm a lawyer, the regulatory path a lot of times is, is one of the hardest things that you have. How do you get it into the rate base for electricity companies? Like you have some folks that are flying beyond visual line of sight. They have special waivers. It's hard to get those waivers from the FAA. You can help uh, push out information about that. Uh, continue to do those things and to show that on the workforce, there's a whole range. How do you use drones where you're working? But then also back to the manufacturing side, what I'm excited about is how can you start, how can we start making these elements? How could we go to a, a zero atoms from China role where we rely, if it's not just the United States, how will we take things in from our partner uh, nations or friends and allies and show how that really meets the ground uh, in uh, the United States and individual states and communities. So please keep doing what you're doing. But I think those things on the workforce to show the jobs, how it will matter and to connect with the decision makers, actually all elements of the community to get the word out. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, uh, on the workforce, you know, it's it's several factors, in my opinion, that come into this. You know, there's 
there's not many what I would call UAS drone subject matter experts that started in the industry from scratch. You know, most people in this industry, they came from a different background. You know, if you're a police officer and you're starting your drone program, well, yeah, you're the guy in charge of it, but you know, you're, you're approaching it from the law enforcement side and this just isn't your expertise, just like any other company that's starting their own drone program, rather your pipeline inspection company or power utility company, you know, so that they're not experts in drones. So on, on the workforce and the educational side, it's really hard to educate them because they don't understand aviation, you know, so that's one aspect of this, you know, this is their aircraft, they're not toys, they're, they're a tool for your toolbox, yes, but you need to have that institutionalized knowledge base to be able to have a good effective uh, program. And on the cyber side is the same deal. You have to ensure that even your pilots that you're training, how they're handling the data and how they protect the devices so that your, your uh, program or your company stays secure with its data. And, you know, because a lot of people, they focus on, well, we need to train the pilots. They need to get the part 107 license. They need to learn how to fly the drones so that they can do the pipeline inspection or what have you. And they don't think about, okay, well, we need to keep teaching our pilots, you know, this iPad that they're going out in the field with, do not take it out of Wi-Fi if you're trying to keep it air gap. Do not, or, you know, don't take it out of uh, airplane mode because if you do and you connect to a cellular network or something else, or if you do an update, um, you know, they, that stuff has to be trained into this. And, you know, a lot of law enforcement guys, you know, they're focused on, you know, what the laws are, how to, uh, you know, be, be civil servants and, not necessarily what some of these data and, and cyber uh, exploits can be done on some of these devices, especially if they're a Chinese company or even an American made system, you know, how to protect that and keep it secure. So, you know, universities, you know, there's several that have started drone programs. We're in, a, we're in the infancy really, you know, I've been doing this for 16 years. I got in the army to be a drone pilot. I've done it my whole life. So I can say that, you know, I'm a, this is, this is my career, this is my life, I've done drones. You know, I didn't start doing it as a architect and now I wanna use it to go, you know, scan buildings to remodel them or anything like that. Or I've, I was an electrician that worked on power lines and now I need to be able to inspect the lines with a drone. You know, so this is a lot of people that are coming into this field and they need this base knowledge. You need to start from scratch and you need to give them good habits from the very beginning. Not, uh, oh, I'm gonna get a drone, I'm gonna play with it and not really learning and educating all of the real factors that go into the ownership of that drone to be able to own it and fly it safely, one, but also how to keep it safe as a device from being externally exploited. Chris, the problem there from an educational standpoint, and this probably is everywhere, is that we have one avenue, which I'll call piloting, drone piloting, regular piloting, and so on. And they have a huge educational budget and they also have multiple courses and everything from ground school to flight school. I went, I went through most of them myself and so I remember what all of these were. It's been many years since I've been behind the wheel though. The, but they're not interested in cyber or security. They're more interested in instrumentation and whether, the, whether, whether I've, I've got the right fuel to air ratio and all kinds of things like this. On the other side, we have the development of IT, which over the years has become very standard Cyber is actually on top of that. This is not just networks and, and keeping storage and moving electrons back and forth and a program here, a program there, which has a nice staff kind of thing. You have cybersecurity is kind of a brand new device, if you will, in the last 20 years, actually 25. And now we have a third factor when it comes to integrating the two, and that's the FAA, which has been given the assignment of integrating for the national aircraft, I'm sorry, national airspace, to do it safely. But they don't recognize that safety has something to do with cyber. They really don't. And their security team is, in my opinion, very weak. Uh, second of all, the legal ramifications, if you will, uh, that FAA tries to put on registering started back in 2016, for instance, that project that has been delayed, 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 delayed uh, because of everything from politics to agency issues. My point is, that these two have not come together as an integrated study, as an integrated training facility. And not only does it need to be a study, it needs to be a continuous study. It needs to be continuing education uh, credits, like 15 a, a year, or maybe just five a year, 
something that says, okay, what happened this year that we can learn from that says, okay, this, this cyber attack went in, this particular SCADA problem existed, this chain, uh, this uh, uh, computer system was more vulnerable than the other for unmanned aircraft, on and on and on. FAA is not looking at that. They're concerned about national critical infrastructure attacks. That's fine. So is DHS and others. The communication goes to places like the intelligence communities with the National Security Agency, CIA, State Department, INR, and satellite, and so on. The cyber tends to be given in these universities where the money is, when there is money, when money is, to computer science, to IT, even to risk assessment in, in insurance. I've seen it there, but it's not necessarily associated with, uh, with a test bed, a place to fly the drones, talking to pilots to know what they're doing, uh, uh, looking at not only the, the, systems, the systems that they're flying, but what information is coming to it from the ground, from the satellite, from an air-to-air -air kind of situation, from uh, beyond the line of sight and so on. None of that seems to go from a cyber. We literally have to train people in looking differently and it's not been, it's been an uphill battle in some ways. So I tend to agree, not every place is that way. Uh, we have some competition overseas in Europe that's doing a fairly good job of it. And that's Embry-Riddle. And they, and SANS, if you wanna look at it from California, is trying to integrate it. We're trying to integrate it at Kansas State. Arizona's doing the same. Naval Post, uh, Naval Graduate School is another good one uh, at Annapolis. Uh, so there are some, but it's not enough because we've got the movement into this field is huge. And the movement of, of and the building of new systems is even huger. Is that a word? Is it even more? more? It is now. Thank you. It's, Trump it's would probably agree. And, whatever they are, huger. Bart, Bart and I got to put one little plug in for industrial psychologists because I'm one myself. Sure. And I do believe that in, in addition to protecting our data, we really need to think about simplifying our data because the farmers and all the people who will use this data, and unfortunately in our government, sometimes we like to build things complex because we make, we then we just keep eating more and more complexity. If you hire industrial psychologists and you design for simplicity, look at the success of Apple controls this ecosystem, it's a simple tool, and if we can embrace that simplicity, then much more of the user community, along with security, the user community could get value in their farms, in their fisheries, but we have to make it simple, along with secure. That's well, I'd, jump, I'd like to jump in on that one too and say, uh, I, I agree, Randy, with what you were saying. We need a pipeline, and as far as simplifying it, to, to realize, yeah, you could talk about uh, DOD 8140, which replaced DOD 8570 and certifications and how to get my part 107 for pilots. I get that, but what we need, the and I think institutions of higher learning are very well positioned and in partnership with Droneport USA to say, this covers, this is cross domain, but it also hits our community. What about business schools? What about understanding the opportunities for this tool, and to Joel's point about simplicity, understanding that, yes, this, these are drones, but these same types of sensors, cloud-connected sensors, and automation, and uh, where artificial intelligence and machine learning is going, they need to see the bigger picture so that this professional could understand, I could work on the technology part, or I could understand the security and the privacy aspects, and to have that, that bigger picture, that's how you steer the workforce with a pipeline in mind. Mm -hmm. And so that all of us collectively, and, and Jerome Port USA, you're doing this, is to be able to say to whichever senator, whichever governor, whoever you're talking to, or uh, community leader, here's where the jobs are, here's where the careers are, family supporting jobs out of drones, and being able to say, yeah, self-driving cars will be the same way, We'll have the same thing for uh, ro robots or home automation with medicine, it, you know, seeing the connectivity of it. And, and one last point for me, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't put in, I'm passionate about indoor drone flights and using drones that are pre-positioned inside of a public space to fly towards the sound of gunfire. If there's an active shooter, terrible uh, tragedies that we've had, what if you could have a trusted well-engineered, collaborative designed drone that fits in the community that could fly and provide visual access for responding law enforcement. Or if we got to the point where we trusted it, 
and the community was okay with using tear gas or pepper spray on that drone, what if it could automatically fly to stop, interrupt an active shooting in 90 seconds, not in 30 minutes or three hours where we've been? Once Walmart picks up those things, or they go in every public building and then outside is one another thing, that's, those are jobs, but if there's something for everybody to, to get their teeth into. And there, there's so many use cases, but I think pipeline to Joel's, to Joel's point and the bigger picture and Joel, keeping it simple is always great. That, that's why DJI has been successful partly because, you know, you can pull a drone out, link it up with your iPad or your iPhone, and you're instantly a drone pilot. You know, you don't really need a lot of experience to be able to fly these things. They've made them so easy and they brought the cost point down to be able to have mass adoption of them. You know, so I like, and I always prefer, you know, DJI is the apple of the drone world or, or you know, the, the toy commercial drone world. But I think we've got one last question and we can keep going if we want. And then it's just extra content. But uh, last one is for Dr. Nichols and Joel Coulter. So drone systems comprise hardware, software, network, sensor, and power elements. What, from your perspective, are great tools that the uh, USA Drone Port needs to consider acquiring to assist these drone organizations to ensure that they are producing secure drone systems? You want to start that one, Dr. Nichols? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to answer that and not overdo what we've already talked about. <laughs> I, I want to add a new area here, if I can, to answer that, because drone ports are really good group to do this with. Let's let's talk about just two sides of the game and then I'm going to make my pitch for one. And I'm going to hand it over to Joel who's going to take this thing and do a much better job than me. The in terms of activities, the use of drones is either monitoring or counter unmanned. Basically CUS or monitoring. Either we're going to be looking at something and gathering data or I'm going to take it down. I mean it's that simple. Uh, in terms of monitoring, you have such things as RF analysis, you have acoustical, uh, which is the microphone basically, you have optical using lasers, you have radar, you have uh, LRAD, which is what I want to come back to in a minute. In terms of the counter unmanned side, and these all need to be tested in the drone port purview, you have a GPS spoofer, which has been used very effectively, and you've heard my arguments on the South China Seas and how the Chinese used uh, spoofers to go against our capital ships and also the uh, commercial ships that became basically a missile uh, to, to provide collision. Um, the microwaves and DEWs, you've got optical laser systems. You again have acoustic, which I'm going to come back to. And lastly, you have this thing called net guns. All right, all of these are, are technologies that can be tested at drone port easily. The one I want to come into is the one we've done our research uh, recently and have written about in, the, in a, one of our textbooks, and that's the acoustical weapon. And the, the acoustical uh, drone weapon, if you will, sends a loud sound to the drone. This is good for drones up to about 1,000 feet from the small class to the moderate class. It has a range of about a mile, and it can be extended, obviously. The acoustical sound that we're talking about is resonance frequency. And if you can hit the MEMS, which is the controlling device, which is handling the rotors, basically, the gyroscope and also the control. And by the way, you cannot protect it by stealth. There's a lot of interesting things you can do with stealth protections inside the drone. Everything from encryption to hardening to sound, uh, protection around and so on, and design itself. But on the outside, you can't. The rotors are still outside there for all practical purposes. So if I can pancake the rotors, if I can do something to knock the rotors out, Without shooting it down, you see, shooting it down is an interesting definition. It refers to the, the use of a weapon, uh, Harry, the, the direct weapon of a shotgun kind of thing. I'm using sound. I'm going to, I'm going to make it go crazy up there. And that's illegal. That's, il that's not illegal. That's legal. At any rate, what that sound does to the MEMS is it, the loud sound is like the woman who sings a very high note and breaks glass, if you can think in the back of your head. It does the same thing to the MEMS component. And what happens is that you get the, the drone suddenly pancakes down and comes, comes to the ground. Or if it's lucky, it goes back to its waypoint or emergency standpoint. Either way, I've confused the drone and I've taken it out of action, which is what I'm trying to do. That's totally legal. 400 feet and less. 401 feet and above, I'm no longer legal because I'm taking down an aircraft. 
That's the, the current rule, which is up, open to all kinds of interpretation, as you can imagine. But according to the Attorney General, in his most recent statement for protective measures, they're concerned with only things 400 feet and above. Therefore, it, by definition, is a legal gray area, even though it's probably not to some minds. I can do something at 400 feet. Well, you can get these weapons from, and I call it a weapon, but these drone acoustics weapons uh, up to about uh, half a mile easily for very little money. They, the, uh, they're made in Netherlands, they're made in Switzerland, Turkey, UK, here, and Germany. Uh, there, I've got several people who make these things. The local one is LRAD, which has been bought by Genesis Systems. And they, have, they use things with the Navy, they use things with the Army. Uh, but they have a hand one, and they also have a shoulder one, looks like a bazooka. You, you can find copies of these out in the net. They're very fascinating. But if you're using sound, I am now disabling the drone. I am not, well, I'm not like a laser destroying the drone, but I'm knocking out its brain. And if I can knock out its brain, then it's just, it's, it's one way of taking out the problem. And I think drone port might be a, a good place to test out this particular theory because it doesn't require any specific, as far as I know, but I'll have to ask Wayne Lonestein and Justine, our lawyers, whether I require any specific things other than part 107. But, but my point is this technology under an uh, experimental side would work very well. I mean, that you're, you're even, uh, even the universities are allowing us to do this. So my question, my answer to you is first, the risk assessment, obviously. Second is SCADA to, to drone port can work with. And third would be to move into the acoustical side. Now there's acoustical weapons. Now I'm gonna pass on to Joel who, who, uh, who has a much better view on this because of his purview. So uh, I just, because I live, I think I live at Manassas, which is near DC. I get exposed to a lot of different things. But as far as tools, I look at the, the great environments we've talked about today and Harry knows this and we know this, that whether it's the Naval Academy, the USA, UAS Academy in Maryland, there are environments all set up using different ways to test and evaluate hardware, software, networks, power elements. Learn about all those other environments. You take off your unique supply chain security. That's your going to be niche. But learn what those other environments are doing. Then plug into things like NIST, who have TV, white space, super IPv6. Look at the next gen protocols and say, what can we bring down here? to be unique at the same time we're exchanging. For example, years ago, I got a $9 million grant to set up all this stuff at Fort Pickett. And I was really happy to move forward. And I got all this surplus drone stuff for military. Military's got surplus drone stuff around the world. You just gotta go find it sitting somewhere not being used by anybody. Hmm. We'll create a whole fabric shop where people can come in and manufacture enhancements to the drones that you get for free. I'm a, I'm a always believed if you know the resources around you, you don't have to spend much money. You just got to know what's around you that you can grab and connect, collaborate with, but set up an environment by which you're unique in this supply chain security area. And then I would add this whole uh, honeycomb has this thing called ironwood. Well, they want to build up this way where you can test and interrogate. It's all basically a, a tax charge, but you in depth, look at the, all the cots. There's, you're not gonna stop all the cot stuff that's being flying in here from all over the place, but people need to have an interrogation of that cots component. Team with the right people to do that. And then you, it's like a UL certification. You give it back and say, yeah, this is, you know, you using this cots from Europe or whatever, but it doesn't have any vulnerabilities we can find. But the other piece of this, I think, is actually starting to produce through optical server, try to get those resources from space or whatever that are much more secure that you can then manufacture and look at how I plug those things into these drones or into oh, data pods that are relays. What can I take my more secure elements that come from the US through this trusted capital marketplace or supply chain and actually integrate into different drone systems, not just air, but let's make it land, air, and sea, as everybody says, because it is it is broader. It's not just air. If we let air drive everything, we can test a lot of things on the ground and the sea with a lot less risk than the air. So let's go do it. Let's not let the air slow down the rest of the robotics research. And Joe, I want to jump in. I took my hat off to you because you mentioned my alma mater, the United States Naval Academy. Ooh, yeah. But they have... <laughs> 
something called the Grace Hopper, named after a great American there with the Mark I and Cyber when it was in its infancy. But then the U.S. Naval Academy has a cybersecurity major, uh, so they have that track. But they have this facility, $106 million, and they'll even have a skiff in there, but they have drones already, and they're doing indoor flights, and they want to do more around Hospital Point and other places. But imagine if we were to get a competition going between the service academies. And to your point about different types of drones, you, you can do amazing things inside of those facilities. Bancroft Hall, one of the largest buildings that exists in the world. I think it's like 33 acres of floor space, 4.5 miles of corridor. Those are my plebe rates. But if you flew drone competitions on the academy, you know, Naval Academy, Air Force Academy, West Point, get them engaged, it would be amazing what you could do to move forward in ways that you wouldn't otherwise be able to. So right. thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, well, no, it's, uh, it brought up a mind. Uh, I have some friends in the UK. So I, years ago, when I was at a coalition experimentation thing, where we had three weeks. And also think about this, having multi-week planning sessions with a joint exercise. But what I learned is that in the UK, Kinetic UK has this amazing capability to measure run different missions and measure all human and machine team interactions. And they also implement it finally into, well, can we help acquisition? Can we help policy? I think policy people need to be able, before they write policy in their own heads, to come to places like the USA Drone Port and really get informed of what the art of the possible is, yes. because that should drive policy. And you've heard me, so collaborative design, that concept, the idea of having a digital twin, so not only the kinetic space of amazing things you can do at these different research places, but take Droneport USA. If you were to consider uh, what you do with human machine pairing sure. as you're working these, these things through, I'm going to make a plug for a drone laser tag, but we'll see where that goes. But the idea would be, how does that work? And then others can collaborate. This is important because if you design the co-design space cloud-based in the right way, mm -hmm. interestingly, it may be able to support some of the third generation of AI work that's been being done by DARPA. And that's DARPA hard, but if you have that in mind at first to go, okay, how about uh, the URSA project, Urban Reconnaissance Through Supervised Autonomy? That's about baking in ethical AI from the beginning. Wow, so what if you have sensors, you've got the digital twin plus the real space, and you're handing that off in a way that researchers take the, the, um, the nation's UARCs uh, university affiliated research centers. You've got Arliss, it's right at the University of Maryland, but consider if you were to say, okay, how are these machines interacting? What is the response? What if I add in a sensor network like that, that relies on body-worn cameras for police and tie it into what we're doing at Droneport USA at that facility? And then you go, okay, let's move beyond and the, what I meant by the cradle for next generation AI. Uh, and this is Hans's world, like Hans is always so far ahead of me on where things are going. But Hava Siegelman, genius lady who's got the lifelong learning machines program at DARPA. If you consider, wow, then you can start to say, this is what we anticipate. People can help construct the very AI that these machines, so it becomes an iterative process, but you have to have that in mind. You should have that in mind from the beginning to save money and do things for free and you'd be surprised who's out there to help you. So just mm -hmm. thanks for mentioning the Naval Academy though. That's my main point. And I'll, I'll just jump in because I, I know we're probably long on time, but, uh, you know, the, the challenge we look at and we face is falling further and further behind in the world when it comes to uh, autonomous systems and then full autonomous systems. And are we shooting ourselves in the foot or not? Um, you know, we have companies out there that, you know, it's like Domino's. Domino's has a ground vehicle that is delivering pizzas um, and, and uh, you know, drinks uh, autonomously in Florida. And they wanted to add in, uh, you know, be able to fly. And that is just becoming a problem that's too far for them to even be able to get to where they want to go. So these, you know, these different companies that are American companies, they're trying to stay American companies. They're having to leave America in order to get where they want to go. Um, and that is a real shame. Uh, that's something that we, we need to, to fix. It's been a problem for 20, 30 years now. Uh, it hasn't been fixed yet. But when we start to look at this, uh, you start to look at all of the different autonomous systems as they start to talk to each other over time and they start to goal seek over time. 
is America really going to be in the forefront of that? Right now, the answer is absolutely not, uh, which is a national security problem that we should be much more involved in, um, and we're simply not. And that's a, a scary world to think that other countries are going to be much further ahead than we are, um, even further than they are right now. Yeah, Hans, well, as, as if, a lawyer if I could, here, I have to say, I'd, I'd love to say that's definitely something that we could work on uh, more. And a lot of times the policy can hold us back, but there's a way to be consistent with our values and make sure that we can do more. In my neighborhood, I live in Washington, D.C., these millennial robots, they are rolling around on the streets. I've seen them walking with my wife. We do a lot more walking these days. And then you can see them pause, work their way through uh, an intersection. Uh, I'm honored to be a visiting fellow with George Mason's uh, National Security Institute. And if you consider, you know, again, putting the other policies that lean forward, that respect, you know, balance our civil liberties, but with national security interests, definitely in the context of this uh, peer comp competition that we have from China, uh, I think you're absolutely right. How do we make it easier for us to, to go forward faster and not hold ourselves back? just because we make the wrong calls on policy or, or regulation. Or, well, and I think, I think we have to look at, you know, and, uh, the aspects of, you know, PR and how to really get the communities and, and people to understand. Uh, several years ago, I was at Black Hat and DEF CON uh, in Vegas, and Vegas has security drones all over the, you know, all over the place within the casinos and the hotels and everything else. So, you know, folks are, it's going to start to come into play as a mainstream, but again, you know, is it going to come into mainstream in too much of a rudimentary uh, area where the rest of the world is moving on? Or is it going to come in uh, as a, a one and one, right? We're going to get drones, then we're going to get ground vehicles, but we're not actually creating an integrated understanding and an infrastructure that actually allows us to move forward, uh, you know, as a country. Yeah. There are, there are companies out there, though, that are at least addressing the AI side of it, Hans. Just today, I got a note from Joel Anderson, who is our, uh, in the vice president's office at research. And he says that Citadel Defense, this is his little note, just launched, he wants me to take a look at this thing, uh, launched their most advanced AI software to protect soldiers and border agents from the nefarious drones that are now doing all kinds of bad, maleficent things, you know, from drugs to surveillance and so on. Uh, I'm familiar with Citadel Defense, but I was not familiar that they had put out something additional so today I've now got another assignment. Uh, my point is there are some companies that are, are trying to take the advanced technology and integrate it with respect to the, the uh, national critical infrastructure and with respect to the, the problems and, all to, uh, and look into the AI at the same side. So it's not a zero sum game. There are a few that are doing this, but we're way outnumbered. We are way out balanced. China's been doing this for a long time. You were talking about schools and hackers. There are entire cities, the uh, Shanghai, uh, China, that is uh, that has thousands of, of of prepared hackers that go after our DoD systems and so on. Well, I don't know that we have the level of numbers going backwards. So, uh, and I don't, and they also have uh, uh, combination agreements with other schools, including American schools, for AI and robotics. And they're they're putting the money up. Well, you can guarantee that, the, that it isn't necessarily for our benefit only, that it's for the benefit of the people putting the money up. So I agree with you, Hans, and all. It's been a pleasure, by the way, Bart, talking with such experienced guys here. This is really great. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Hans. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Bart, for permitting me to join the party on this thing. I'm, I respect you all just very much, and it's, uh, I, I'm honored. That's the only way I can put it. Thanks, Randy. Likewise. <laughs> I feel the same way. It's amazing the talent that uh, and backgrounds that you all have. Really appreciate you all for uh, for being in this with us and sharing your uh, background, your opinions. I, they they matter, and hopefully, little by little, the word will get out with what we're talking about. Because I think a lot of people just have their heads buried in the sand and don't realize it or don't care that this stuff is actually going on. And I think this is a first step of ways of getting this information out to the general public. They have to understand, they have to learn, but if we can turn this ship around at all. Uh, one final thing uh, about the USA drone port earlier today, and Chris mentioned it when he was speaking earlier about uh, flying a drone and architect using it for buildings. Uh, 
there was an architect we were speaking to earlier about building the indoor plat facility that's getting ready to go up at the USA Drone Port. Uh, that indoor plat facility uh, will be able to be uh, reconfigured to do a lot of things. And one of the things I'm really excited about, and hope that we are able to do, is start very young, five, six year old kids, start teaching them the right methodology, like Dr. Nichols was talking about. See this phone, be scared of it. Be careful with what you do. This is plugged into this device, be scared of it. If we teach them at a young age, then we can start turning this. I don't know, you know, I don't know later on in life if we're going to be able to change a lot of it. I, my, my sons are attached to the phone, literally live off of it, have subscriptions, don't even watch TV anymore. They sit here like this all the time watching their phone. Um, we're, we're up against this, but what I'm hoping is that we're building the foundation with this indoor flight facility, with this weather facility, and with the vast amount of land and acreage we have uh, to be able to do things that can be retooled as this goes forward, that we can train young people and that we can bring innovative minds like your all's to this location so we can begin training people correctly and effectively to help them carry out this mission. So, you know, what you all are talking about is, in, is incredibly important. It's imperative that the word gets out. Uh, nobody else could have done any better job on this uh, group, this focus group that we've got here. So uh, I applaud each one of you. I really appreciate uh, appreciate the information you've shared with us and spending your time with us. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.